Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. We're glad to have you. Boy, what a beautiful, beautiful day it is. Welcome to Jesus and Jeans Worship at the Cottage. We're so glad that you join us, especially if you're joining us via the internet. We're always honored that you take time wherever you are to uh, to worship with us and join us. And uh, we we just thank you so much. I I get emails from time to time from from some folks who watch and. It's just always great and encouraging to uh, to hear those uh, to read those e emails, and so thank you, thank you for sending. My name's Teddy Baker, along with my wife Jan, Jim and Sandra Penner, Bobby and Dawn Privet, on the tech technical end this morning. Karen and Chuck Watkins, our whole team here at Jesus and Jeans, we welcome you and thank you for being with us. We're going to do uh, just a couple of great old hymns this morning. I just this week as I was. Looking at uh, at the message, I, it, these songs just kept popping up in my in my heart and in my mind, and I said, "Okay, we're going to do these songs here this week." So, you ready? Let's praise the Lord. Majesty, worship His Majesty. Unto Jesus, the all glory. Honor and praise, Majesty, Kingdom of Honor, go from His throne unto His own, His anthem praise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Jesus the King, Majesty, worship His Majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings, so exalt, lift up on high the name. Jesus the King, Majesty, worship His Majesty, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings, Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. God is 
son not spare me, send him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled. To take away my sin, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art! How great thou art! Then sings. certainly for Israel, pray for the peace of Israel and uh, uh, just the uh, atrocities that are taking place there and we, we just pray for uh, a speedy end that, uh, that on both sides that uh, people will be on, honored, innocent people. Uh, I, I know in war it's always uh, the ugly part of war that uh, civilians uh, get hurt, they get killed, families torn apart. And so we, we certainly want to pray for the, the peace there in Israel. I want to pray, uh, continue to pray for Jan. Uh, we go next Friday uh, to uh, a new gastrologist to try to determine if she really has this condition called hemochromatosis that they're trying to, to determine. Um, and so just pray that uh, we're, we're excited about uh, this new doctor. And uh, Jan was able to get away this weekend and kind of take some time off and just kind of get her heart and mind prepared for that and so uh, but we go next Friday and so appreciate your prayers on that I want to continue to pray for uh, Bonnie and Howard's daughter Tanya um, pray for Bonnie and Howard they're uh, traveling so we want to pray for traveling mercies for them uh, she just has some ongoing health issues I want to continue to pray for Kurt and Laura uh, Mather uh, <coughs> Uh, my good friend Debbie McLawhorn has uh, stage four cancer, and uh, she's been able, been accepted at MD Anderson, and uh, uh, they appear to be doing just some great work uh, with her out there. I want to continue to pray for Crystal, Bob and Janet's uh, daughter, uh, still dealing with uh, the antibiotics for a streptococcus infection in her blood. 
I want to continue to pray for Brenda uh, Penner, that's Jim's sister-in-law, and uh, I was talking to Jim this morning, that's, uh, you may remember uh, Jim's brother Sid uh, passed away a couple of years ago with uh, pancreatic cancer, and so now Sid, uh, Sidney's wife, um, Brenda, and they found an abnormality uh, on her pituitary gland, and so she's uh, starting with radiation, having radiation treatments for that, so we want to pray uh, certainly for Brenda. Uh, Heather Leake, Hans and Bert's uh, daughter-in-law, dealing with uh, leukemia. Uh, Donna Dulac, her son uh, Zachary, has a brain tumor. And uh, Gary Knotts, I uh, want to continue to pray for health issues for him. Uh, our good friend Susan South, uh, just ongoing uh, health issues for her. I want to welcome John and Kathy back from their world tour. Man, that was, what an incredible, incredible trip. Uh, that's just... That's a once-in-a-lifetime kind of deal, boy. It? Absolutely. It really was. Yeah. I want to continue to pray for John's niece and nephew, Juanita and Marklin, ongoing health issues for them. Uh, I want to continue to pray for Tori, uh, is uh, just doing well, and again, just the opportunity for her to uh, be on um, uh, uh, the list to get a new liver. And so she had an aortic valve replacement in her heart to get her heart strong enough to where she could get back on the list to get a liver. So we want to continue to pray for Tori. Uh, Henry McMillan, uh, ongoing health issues there. Uh, Maria Barbado, uh, same thing, vertigo. Um, Bruce Johnson, also dealing with cancer. Uh, Joe Young, Stephen Kathy Schmidt's sister-in-law. Um, they uh, are supposed to do uh, some treatment, I think, toward the end of this month. And uh, Phil Nelson is Steve's uh, uncle, as well has cancer. I want to continue to pray for uh, Hinton Dalton and Georgia Kate, uh, two kids. One, uh, Hinton was in a just horrific uh, car accident, and uh, Georgia was in a four-wheel accident. But both of them uh, have suffered some physical uh, problems there and still trying to, to get them back uh, on board uh, health-wise. I want to continue to pray for Joy. Uh, she got had her biopsy. They did find uh, some cancer in her lung, but it's a very slow-growing cancer. And so we're just praying that she's gonna she got an appointment to with Emory to try to get into Emory uh, for a, a special type of treatment that uh, uh, Emory is the only place in the state of Georgia that accepts it. So or or that performs it. And so we just pray for Joy that she'll be able to be accepted into that um, that program and. Uh, and God will just bring that healing. He'll start showing off. Amen. I want to pray for our sister-in-law, uh, Diane Hire. She had uh, breast cancer uh, surgery this past uh, Friday. And so she's now in uh, recovery mode on that. Uh, Lisa just uh, Lisa Reed had a praise report. You know, her family, part of her family from Louisiana, joined us last week, and uh, they thoroughly enjoyed their time here. And now they're 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 home safe. So we thank God for traveling mercies there. And then Wayne has a cousin, Johnny Val, who uh, uh, Wayne said he's just like one infection away in his knee, uh, where they may have to do uh, an amputation. And so we just want to pray that uh, that infection will be taken care of. I want to continue to pray for uh, Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie had a knee surgery. Uh, Pam uh, for, from Atlanta Sightseeing is one of our drivers that, that uh, visits here uh, just about every Sunday. And uh, she has a, she had a, an immediate loss of hearing. Went to bed one night, woke up the next morning, and hearing had, had uh, she lost her hearing. And it, it's a condition called sudden hearing loss. And, uh, and then they found out uh, this week that she has a tumor behind her eye, behind her retina. And uh, so we just pray, because I think she lost some of the hearing in, her, in, in, the, in the other ear as well. So pray, pray for Pam. And then we have two unspoken prayer requests that we want to lift up. Um, uh, Glenn's, uh, Glenn's daughter, uh, where's Glenn? Outside. He's outside? Oh, okay. Glenn's daughter, Jessica, uh, had the flu, and uh, they got her some Tamiflu, got her going, so she's recovering. Uh, thankfully, uh, her daughter, Sidney, did, didn't get the flu, and uh, uh, her uh, husband didn't get the flu. So we, we praise God that uh, it didn't, didn't spread through the family, and we just pray for Jessica's healing there. Uh, Want to uh, just a little little praise report, a, a shout out to uh, our dad, uh, Jim Hires, uh, turns 96 years old. Today. 
and boy, you know, still lives alone, still lives by himself, and uh, you know, just gets out, walks every day, and uh, he's just rocking it, man, at 96, I want to tell you, just, I love that, I just love it. So, let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we thank you for, first of all, for making this day, for waking us up and allowing uh, the, the breath just to, to move through our bodies as we woke up this morning in a, in a time change and things that are going on, Father, I just looked out the window and said, yeah, you did it again. This is the day that you have made. And we rejoice and we're glad in it. That we can be part of it. That we can gather together as your children and worship you. To lift our praise, our heartfelt praise. For all that you are. You are the king of who we are. And we thank you, Lord. That you never leave us, you never forsake us. That underneath are your everlasting arms. That even that when we fall, that any, any time that we fail, any time we miss the mark, your spirit is always there to lift us up and guide us in, back into the right direction. We thank you, Lord, for that kind of love, for that kind of compassion, for that grace and that mercy. It's so prevalent in our lives. Help us to tap into that on a daily basis. We lift up every prayer request to you, Father, knowing that you're already there. You're already in the midst of every situation, that you go before us through every trial. And I just pray, God, that you would, as I pray all the time, that you, you would provide what is needed in every situation, whether it's healing, whether it's a faith that needs to be strengthened, whether it's uh, just compassion, the help, everything that, that you are capable of providing. Lord, we thank you for doing that. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill this place. Fill our hearts and our lives. Change us from the inside out. That we might be better prepared to engage the world around us that they may be able to see Jesus in us. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for every single day that you give us. We ask these blessings in the most powerful name, that of your son, Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going we're gonna to be in kind of a, a, a unique book of the Bible. And uh, we're going to be in the, in the, in the book uh, of Jude. And uh, Jude is right before Revelation. So if you want to start at the back, back there at maps and go forward, you'll, you'll find Jude right before Revelation. But uh, <clears throat> I wanted to tell you a story. During, uh, during an earthquake a few years ago, the inhabitants of, of this small village were very much alarmed because the people had reason to be afraid of this disaster because this earthquake, this disaster had destroyed many of the homes and businesses in this village. Many lives were lost. And, and there was this one old woman who everybody in the village knew that was surprisingly calm and joyous even. And finally, one of them said to her, Mother, are, are you not afraid? No, she said. She said, I rejoice to know that I have a God who can shake the world. <laughs> Don't you just love that spirit? I have a God. I rejoice to know that I have a God who can shake the world. There's no doubt that the God we serve is immensely powerful. He can shake the world. Why? Because he created the world. And after all, as the old song reminds us, he's got the whole world where? In his hands. And part of the glory of 
God's presence and power is that in this world, there are numerous wonders that all of us, I'm sure, have seen at some point. Miracles, healings, majestic landscapes, the beauty of a, a starlit sky, the birth of a, a newborn baby. And God has demonstrated his great power throughout the history of mankind. From the deliverance of, of the promised land to the Israelites to the resurrection of his son, Jesus. And today, again, our scripture is going to come from the book of Jude. And so if you're already there, or if you haven't, if you have your apps, go ahead and turn there. And as you're there, I, I wanted to set the background a little bit. In my opinion, this book of Jude is just one chapter. And Jude kind of starts out with one idea. And it sounds like he's trying to you know, offer some encouragement to the people that he's writing to. But he, he, he starts out with one idea. And then suddenly he just turns on a dime. I mean, he just, just turns and instead of writing this encouraging letter, he begins to write this sort of scathing letter giving this stark warning about all of the false teachers. You remember a couple of weeks ago, I, I taught about false teachers and final days. And uh, he was a, another apostle, almost like Paul. He was appearing to set the stage for the end times. And the book of Jude is actually known as a bad news book. Uh, because he begins with an apology for not writing what he intended. He, he wanted to talk about the commonality of their faith. And instead, he found it necessary to remind them of their common enemies. Those kind, kinds of enemies that Judah writes, uh, Jude writes about will become more and more prominent, he says, in the last days. Which again, as, as I told you a couple of weeks ago, Paul, Jude, many of the apostles already believed that they were, they were already living in the last days. And as I told you a couple of weeks ago, we've been in the last days since Jesus walked out of the tomb. And so we, we've been in those final days. And so finally, at the end of this one chapter, Jude begins to kind of rein it in a little bit. You know, he's been, he's just been blasting these false teachers and he begins to talk about how Christ followers should live and he gives them three ways to accomplish this and so we're going to be looking at verses uh, 20 through 25 and so let's start out we're just going to take these in sections and so I want you to look at verse 20 and 21 and it says this and I'm going to read from the message translation it says, but you, dear friends, carefully build yourselves up in the most holy faith by praying in the Holy Spirit, staying right at the center of God's love, keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our master, Jesus Christ. And Jude closes out this verse. He says, this is the unending the unending life, the real life. And so Jude tells them three ways. Number one, he says, carefully build yourselves up in the faith. In other words, keep on pursuing God's word. Don't get caught up in the listening to these false teachers and all the, the things that they're proclaiming. He says, build yourself, take it upon yourself to build yourself up in the faith. And then secondly, he says, and, and you do that by praying in the Holy Spirit. And, and that's, that's a great way to study the Bible is that you, you open up scriptures and you just ask, Holy Spirit, enlighten my heart, enlighten my mind, help me to see, take the scales off my eyes so that I can see exactly what your word is telling me. And then secondly, he says, stay at the center of God's love. You know, don't, don't get off track. Don't take a detour. Just stay in the center of God's love. And then keeping your arms open and outstretched, ready for the mercy of our master. 
I, I think that's three great ways to honor God is always being saying, Lord, I'm, I know I don't have it all together. And so I, I'm, I'm standing here, arms outstretched, ready to receive the mercy that you offer me. That keeps you from taking yourself too seriously, doesn't it? That you have that opportunity to praise God. To keep yourself open, ready for His mercy. Even when we miss the mark. That's the kind of God that we serve. And then Judah, in verses 22 and 23, Judah gives them and us also instructions on how to treat others who struggle with their faith. Even those that leave the faith. And he says, there's three things I want you to do here in verses 22-23. It says, go easy on those who hesitate in the faith. Go after those who take the wrong way. And then be tender with sinners, but not soft on sin. The sin itself stinks to high heaven. We've all experienced that. You know, we've all experienced those struggles in our life that are just sometimes overwhelming. And so uh, I, read this, uh, I read this quote this past, uh, this past week. Uh, Warren Wearsby uh, said this. He says, when, a, when a, a, a flashlight grows dim or quits working, do you just throw it away? Of course not. You change the batteries. When a, a person messes up or find themselves in a, a dark place, do you cast them aside? No. You help them change their batteries. Some need a double A battery. They need attention and affection. Some people need a triple A battery. They need attention, affection, and acceptance. Some need a C battery. They need compassion. Some need a D battery. Direction. And if they still don't seem to shine, then he says simply sit with them quietly and share your light. And then finally Judah comes to this place that we want to focus on this morning. It was, you know, it, it, it was back then, it probably still is common today that synagogue and services in the synagogue often ended with praise to God. After all, it, it's always appropriate that we pause to praise God. Amen? Mm -hmm. and, and so Jude concludes this short book with praise for God's great power. Look at verses 24 and 25. It says, And now to him who can keep you on your feet, standing tall in his bright presence, fresh and celebrating to our one God, our only Savior, through Jesus Christ our Master, be glory, majesty, strength, and rule before all time, and now... And to the end of all time. Yes. And so this morning I want to focus on these two verses. And, and, and look at Jude's praise. That, that we might be able to more effectively praise God. And so as we, we look at Jude's praise. My, my prayer is, is that we will see a God who is able. That is the title, title of our message today. He is able. And there's four ways that I see here that God is able to work in our lives. Number one, God is able to preserve you. In verse 24a it says, And now to him who can keep you on your feet. The English Standard Version said, To him who is able to keep you from falling. Jude has, has written about He's written about all the dangers of falling away, all these false teachers and how they're impacting the church. Uh, actually, up in verse 4, Judah writes this. He says, 
What has happened is that some people have infiltrated our ranks. Our scriptures warned us this would happen. Who beneath their pious skin are shameless scoundrels. Their design is to replace the sheer grace of our God with sheer license. Which means doing away with Jesus Christ, our one and only master. And so, the thing I want you to notice is that these false teachers are among the believers. They are among the Christians in, in this church. But they didn't come from the outside. But they came from the inside. And in verse 12, Judah says, These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm. In other words, they come in and they come to worship and they hang out with everybody and, and, and they don't have one problem eat, sitting down to eat and fellowshipping with these people. And he says that they are shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. If you have no fruit and you're uprooted, you're twice dead. And so the, the question would naturally arise, if these false teachers have fallen away, then what about me? How, how easy is it for me to fall away? How, is it e how easy is it for you to fall away? How am I going to be safe from false teaching, from falling away from the faith? You, you know, as did the Christians to whom Jude wrote, that falling away is a real possibility. I've, I've seen it in my own life. I, I've been there, done that. Struggled with my faith. Over 30 years of ministry, yeah. Yeah. I've struggled. I've had doubts. I've had, uh, I've experienced, I think, every aspect of, of, of this faith-building journey. In Galatians 5.4, it says, You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. You see, that's what happens in religion. When we take religion and we we substitute that religion for our relationship with Jesus Christ it distorts and and actually affects our falling away from the grace of God that he's offered and so these false teachers were trying to teach and they were trying to make the gospel more difficult than it was let, let me give you one one simple way that you can share the gospel and this is, this is just the most simple way that I can think of. Is that Jesus left his place to come to your place. And he came to take your place so that at the end of the time, end of the day, so to speak, that he can take you back to his place. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? He left his place to come to your place to take your place so that he could take you back to his place. That's the most simple way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Peter wrote about, when he was talking about these false teachers, he said, if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. And so Peter is saying, look, if, if, if you were so strong and moving along greatly in the faith and all of a sudden you fell away and you separated yourself from the grace of God, if you got so caught up in the religion that you serve, all the trinkets, all the ceremony, all, everything else that you present, that is not Jesus Christ. That is religion. It's not relationship. And Peter said, if you end up in that way, you're going to be worse off now because you don't have any foundation to stand on. You've sold out the religion. you bought into the religious aspects of your faith. And that is not 
Jesus Christ who is I am. Does that make sense? That's what Jesus, you go through the book of John and I think it's like 24 different times where Jesus said, I am living water. I am the bread of life. I am the light. I am. But see, the people, the, the, the religious leaders couldn't see it. They couldn't see him as I am. They could only see their religion because that's what they could control. That's how they can manip manipulate people. And so the possibility of, of falling away really is only half the story. God is able to preserve us. He's able to keep us from falling away. And so how is it that God preserves us? Let me give you this illustration. When my mom used to make jam, we had a big old fig tree right outside our house, and I'd go out and pick figs. And she loved to make fig preserves, and man, I loved it. And so I would watch her pour wax, and some of you ladies, y'all, you've probably done that. Some of you guys do if, you, if you're into canning. I'd watch her pour wax over the top of the preserves until it was at the brim of the jar. And then she would carefully wipe some wax around the rim itself and then place this rubber lid on it tight. And the wax and the vacuum caused by the cooling preserves would seal that jar so tight that, that it, could, it, it could have sat in the basement, it could have sat on the shelf for years. And the jam would have been just as good when it was finally opened. Sealed, preserved, protected. You see, in, in our house, the dust didn't have time to gather on those jars because, like I said, I love fig preserves. But just saying, if they did stay there for an extended amount of time, they could have lasted if it was necessary. You know, some would argue that God will preserve us in spite of what we do. However, here's what Scripture tells us, that God preserves us in that we cannot be tempted beyond what we can endure. John 10, 29 says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Satan cannot come by, he can't come by force and take us out of the hand of Christ. It's not going to happen. 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us that no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Another way that God preserves us is through his word, through the power of his word. Psalm 119, 11, David wrote, he said, I have hidden your word in my heart, in my inner person, that I might not sin against you. God instilled that word, that, that his word, with great power. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Again, not the muscle beating in your chest, that inner person, that inner spirit of who we are. That's Hebrews 4.12 tells us that. That word informs us that how we can keep from falling away. And after instructing Christians to add virtues to their lives, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.10, he said, if you do these things, if you keep adding godly values to your life, he says you will never fall. So it's possible to keep from falling. And God's word will tell us how to make that possibility a reality. For example, 
In James 4, 7, and 8, it says, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. How do you resist the devil? No. That's the word. Go ahead and use it. It's the hardest word to use in the English language. Statistically, I'm not lying. It's the hardest word to use. Resist the devil. No, and here's what he will do. He will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. And so as we walk with God, he will draw, draw near to us, and he will preserve us. He will keep us from falling. Notice something rather important here, that God is able to preserve us, but we have to be willing for him to preserve us. Amen? God won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear, but we have to endure the temptation. We have to face it. Again, uh, Warren Wearsby wrote, he says, when God permits his children to go through the furnace, he keeps his eye on the clock and his hand on the thermostat. His loving heart knows how much and how long. God's word has great power to preserve us. But again, we have to look into it. We have to read it. We have to memorize it. We have to take ownership of it. And when we do that, God draws near to us. But our responsibility is to draw near to him first. And so my question is, is God preserving you this morning? Are you allowing God to preserve you? The second way that God is able is that God is, number one, God's able to preserve you. God is also able to present you. In verse 24b, it says, God is able to present you before his glorious presence, and I love this part, without fault and with great joy. Do you ever see yourself that way, that God looks at you without fault and, and with great joy? That's how he loves you. You know, you, you can't say God is love and, and God is angry. No, God is love. That is his character. That is who he is. He cannot be different than who he is. And so God is able to present us faultless and with great joy. And the Bible is filled with evidence to the fact that God has, God has a great and glorious presence in our lives. In Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 and 35, it says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. That's where, where the religious leaders met. That's where they met for worship. So the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And it says that Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle to the point that Moses couldn't enter. It was the presence of the, of the Lord. And in Psalm 8, 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Exodus 24, 17, it says, because the Lord's glory is so great to those uh, that have experienced God's glory that it, it says to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. When Isaiah saw a, a divine representation, he said, Woe to me, I am mine, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. But notice one thing of what God's going to do. He's going to present us before His glorious presence. And it is a place that mortal man cannot dwell. 
And when Moses asked to see God, the Lord allowed him to see his back. Because God said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. That's how powerful God's presence was in Exodus 33, 20. God will preserve us in this case and will allow us to be in his glorious presence. And when we are in God's presence, we will be without fault and we will have great joy. I, I know being without fault is God's doing. It's not mine. I tell you all the time, I am not your role model. I mess up every day. There are things in my life I struggle with and have struggled with most of my life. In my family, we put the fun in dysfunctional. <laughs> and so there are things that, that I continually deal with constantly. Romans 3 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless, is what Romans 3, 10 and 12 says. There is no one who does good, not even one. So I say, I'm not your role model. He is. And so, let me ask you, what, what sin, I'm, it's a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to answer this, so, but just think about it. You know, we, we don't want your dirty laundry right here this morning. Uh, amen. <laughs> but what sins are, 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 do, do you struggle with? What, what things do, do you deal with either publicly or privately? What, what is it that you would give anything in this world if you could go back and undo? What, what action causes you shame and embarrassment every time you remember it? I got a bunch of them. <laughs> See, God's going to take you and having removed all of that, he will present you faultless before his throne. Yeah, but Teddy, you don't, you don't understand what I... No, I don't. But God does. And his promise is he's going to present you before his throne faultless. Every struggle you've had, every sin you've committed will be forgotten and you will be perfect before God's throne. Psalm 103, 11 and 12 says, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. And again, it's not being afraid of him. It's who revere him, who have a reverence for him. And he goes on to say, As far as the east, east is to the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I always thought about that verse. Why did, he, why did he say as far as from the north and the south? Because the north are fixed places. North pole, south pole. But the east becomes the west. And the west becomes the east. And they never catch up with each other. And God says, that's how far I'm removing all of your transgressions. As far as the east is from the west. Now, I don't know about you, but that's just such a wonderful picture. Wonderful picture of encouragement of how God loves us. In the book of Micah, I talked from last week, Micah 7, 18, 19, it says, Who is a God like you? Who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us 
And you will tread our sins underfoot, underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. I love this quote. One writer wrote one time, he reminds us that when God casts someone's sins into the depths of the sea, he places a sign nearby that reads, no fishing. <laughs> no reason to go dig them up. No reason to go back and revisit. What a beautiful thought that God takes all of our sins and he hurls them. He doesn't just drop them in. No. Just picture God rearing back and just hurling every struggle you've ever had into the depths of the sea. And then even more importantly, to remember them no more. For those who are in Christ, there's even a greater promise in Romans 8.1. It says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 1 John 1.7 reminds us that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And so again, the question for you today who are here, if you're watching over the internet, have you accepted the invitation for all of your sins to be forgiven through Christ? Have you done that? If you have, here's the good news. You could stand before God's throne this very morning and on His promise, Christ will present you faultless. <laughs> I've, never, I've never felt that. You know, when I look in the mirror, I see all the things that need to be fixed and changed and lost and rebuilt and all that stuff. Try looking in the mirror of going... I'm king's kid. I stand before the throne of God faultless. He has taken every struggle, every sin, everything that I, I have faced in life, and he's already tossed them into the sea. And again, there's no reason to keep carrying that stuff around. Best way to win a tug of war let go of the rope. Game over. You see, we, we've never experienced joy like we'll have when we stand before God's throne. We'll, we'll have the joy of gazing into the face of the one who died for us. We, we'll have the joy of all of our sin, all of our struggles, all of our sicknesses, and all the diseases put far, far behind. We'll have the joy of, of being reunited with our, our loved ones who died in Christ. We'll have the joy of hearing the Lord say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. So again, the question is for you this morning, is, is that kind of joy going to be yours? Are you willing to take ownership of who you are in Christ? Because I believe we stand before his throne every day. The Bible tells us as believers that we're already seated in the heavenly places. We're already there. We're just walking around in these earth suits until they wear out. But every single morning, his mercies are new and his compassion never fails. The fourth way that God is able to, that he is able to receive our praise. 
It says, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, and power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. See, Jude refers to God as the only God, our Savior. He is likely compelled to refer to God in such a manner because the, the false teachers of that day, and there are false teachers even today, they were constantly combating. They were constantly fighting. <laughs> and again, in verse 4, he describes these men as godless men who changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they denied Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And there were very many in the early church, especially these false teachers who claimed Christ was not truly divine, that he wasn't divine and, and human. He wasn't fully God and fully man. And that's still true today. There are still many false teachers who teach, in my opinion, a false doctrine about the divinity of Christ. Many believe that he was a good man, that he was a prophetic teacher, that he was one who had compassion and grace, but he was not fully human and fully God. And so, again, what Jude may very well be doing here is to say that both the Father and the Son are fully divine, and they both worked in concert, quite actively, I might add, for mankind's salvation. It was their doing. In this doxology that Jude talks about, he talks about the glory of God. Glory refers to God's radiance, his moral splendor. Again, at the dedication of the temple, it says the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple in 1 Kings 8.11. God's glory was so greatly manifested that mortals could not enter the temple. He talks about majesty. Majesty refers to God's greatness. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength, Psalm 93.1 tells us. He talks about the power that you, you will know that the Lord has power like no other. In Job, in the book of Job, it says, By his power he churned up the sea. By his wisdom he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. <clears throat> and Job says these are just the fringe of his works. He talked about the authority that God alone has great authority. 2 Chronicles 26 says, you, you are the Lord, God of our fathers. Are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. This praise is to be ascribed to God before all ages, now and forevermore. It's, it's right that God would have eternal praise Re Revelation 4 8 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And so the question is, are you offering God the praise which is due Him? Not just, you know, thank you, Lord, for letting me wake up this morning. God, I give you praise. You know, thank you for a beautiful day. Blah, 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 blah. No, do you get intimately involved in talking to the Lord like He is your Father? You see, there, there are always people who either don't or won't praise God for a number of reasons. People who will attend worship services won't always gather to praise God. I, I, I was in the, one of the mega churches one, one time, and I was talking to one of the businessmen, and I was asking, I said, what, what ministry are you, are you involved in? He said, well, I'm not involved in ministry. I, I, I come to church here. I come here to network <laughs> to build his business. <clears throat> a lot of people look at it as a ritual of going to church. Check. I went to church. Went to worship. Check. Read my Bible. Get a devotion. Whatever. 
And so my question for us this morning is, when God has done so much for us, when he has promised to do so much in our lives, when he has loved us so much, how can we not be willing to literally fall on our faces before him in praise? I mean, how is that even possible for a Christ follower? And so is your life filled with praise to the Father? Do you acknowledge his power and presence in your life? Do others see Jesus in you. My prayer is that we will choose to live lives of praise before the Father so that one day we can be just like that lady during the earthquake. I rejoice to know that I have a God who can shape the world. And if he can do that, he can change your life. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, to you, it is to you that we give our praise, that we offer our hearts and our lives to you. God, it's just not something I pray about every week. I, I actually want you to come and fill our hearts and our lives, to change us from the inside out, that people around us might be able to see Jesus in us. Help us to take ownership of that part of our relationship with you. To praise you even in the storms. We love you, Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming.